fans in the place where you live. Welcome back to Bizarre Podcast, Dogs Must Die. My name is Grant, you can call him Chip, and we are back at it again with the very first three episodes of uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3, Stardust Crusaders. And it's weird. Everything's weird now. (laughs) Uh, Everything is different. Everything's different. Again, this is where JoJo really began. Uh, (laughs) I was wondering how long it would take. I mean, this is probably... With part three, probably the biggest change to what JoJo is known for now in that the way everyone fights is going to be really different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Part three picks up right where the the teaser at the end of part two ended with, uh, you know, 1983 in the Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. near the Canary Islands again. Uh, Some salvagers are pulling up that chest. In episode one, a man possessed by an evil spirit. Ah, yes. Uh, I want to call out the very first shot. Uh, The camera is upside down. We are seeing the sea above the sky. And then there is a vertical pan as the camera basically does half a backflip uh, all the way to normal uh, uh, to to show this boat winching up the super coffin. Right. I forgot about that shot. They they, they pull up Dio's super super coffin, which, again, Mm -hmm. you you asked this in the the recap we did of part two. Wait a minute. (laughs) How... <laughs> so just half an hour ago before recording, I went back to uh, the final ripple to see how things went down yeah. as that boat went down. And I wasn't forgetting anything. No. There's no like, <laughs> there's no foreshadowing what will be explicitly stated not too far from here. So I don't feel like we're spoiling a reveal. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happens is Dio did get Jonathan's body and dove into a secret second man-sized yes. compartment yes. in the bottom of the coffin. Yeah, Arena was riding on basically on the lid of the secret compartment. And when mm-hmm. she was rescued, they just grabbed her and the baby and then pick up the coffin too. And so that then just sank into the apparently, ocean. yeah. A- apparently, yeah. Dio is is like Joseph fast and did all of that <laughs> and jumped in the secret compartment, <laughs> yeah, unnoticed, unseen, and then the the coffin was just abandoned to to sink so straight down it got back inside the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so goofy. To be discovered a hundred years later. <laughs> it's so goofy. Yeah. There's uh so there's some like random like JoJo novelizations. Some of them are like adapting the actual parts and some of them are mm-hmm. completely new stories and they're written by other different authors. And somebody rewrote that part so that Arena actually picked up somehow the massive body of Jonathan and put it in that secret compartment herself so that he could get a proper burial or something. Oh, that's sweet, actually. Yeah. That does mean, however, that she did drag Jonathan's (laughs) body while still gripping out the Dio still living head and just stuck that in the coffin, too, and went like, I'll deal with that head later. Oh, oh, I don't like that. That makes her dumb. It's it's better if she just kicked it like a football. And, yeah, I mean... And, I, and then he, he skittered on his neck veins uh, un, unnoticed. Like, if you did that and knew, like, hey, there's a fucking living, alive vampire head in this coffin with my husband's fucking bo- dead body, just open it in the in a sunny area. Just open it yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And he's done. You put yourself in the secret compartment safe and him in the sunny compartment. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's very goofy, like, but at the same time, I understand the allure of having a cliffhanger where the Dio coffin gets dredged up, dredged up from the sea, <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, because you, you might be able to invent any number of other ways for, for Dio to, to be slumbered and then, uh, to, to slumber and then be re- reawoken a hundred years later, mm-hmm. but none of them immediately communicate that like the super coffin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I, I went back and I, I rewatched that bit of, mm-hmm. of the final Ripple episode uh, uh, and, and Jonathan's death and be like, oh, man, Jonathan's death gets me. It's been so long. Yeah. And still like, ah, oh. so so I could, you know, check the sources. And then I'm describing to, to Elena what happened and why I care. <laughs> and she's like, you're angry about th- you are upset about this. <laughs> yes, I am. I am upset about this. <laughs> This is a betrayal of continuity, and it matters. Yeah, yeah. Man, even though you only spend nine episodes, like, it, it, part one feels so far 
like in the past now that when you do go back to that part, like for some reason the 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 Jonathan's death hits harder now than it did when it first happens. Mm-hmm, I don't mm-hmm. know why, but and anybody who knows like my tastes and and mm-hmm. my opinions will be surprised to know that I'm suddenly like caring about continuity in that way. And let me tell you why that is. Yeah. Dio somehow surviving, stealing Joseph's body and and like coming up on top in in their eternal struggle. That's fine. That's mm-hmm. a perfectly good story. But doing it in a way that immediately that, that undercuts something uh, Jonathan saw coming and worked specifically to prevent. Yeah, that's bullshit. That yeah. is fucking bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. It, it was funny. I, I I was remembering the first time I like went through or, or got to part three and, you know, saw the teaser of, of Dio's super coffin getting pulled up. And I remember back then. So for some reason, I didn't put it together. They're like, "Wait a minute! How did this happen?" I was like, "Oh, Dio's back!" And that that was all. That was the only thought that went through my head. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it is something. It, it's very different uh, between you know that being published what four years later yeah. versus you know watching it in animation couple weeks later <laughs> yeah yeah definitely plays differently but i guess let's get back to the action with the super ripley bodybuilder salvager <laughs> dude these guys are fucking ripped these guys are hilarious and it's the, this is literally the only scene they're in they're not you know zero percent body fat no name guys <laughs> yeah these guys are just huge and you know, they're, they, they're they getting... haul up the super coffin one of them says quote hold on wait this is bizarre ah <laughs> yeah. i get it i got gotcha. you uh-huh but yeah, they're like chipping away uh, stuff that is that has grown onto uh, the super coffin, and you know, chip off enough to to fully reveal Dio. And they're just like D I O. Yeah, yeah, what? not Dio the guy, but Dio the inscription on the lock. <laughs> yeah, of course he labeled his super coffin. <laughs> But, you know, one guy's super impatient, just like, I don't give a fuck that this coffin is weird. Just open it up. There's got to be some good shit in there. They smash the lock instead of picking it, which is good for them. Poor father sticks. Oh, (laughs) poor guy. (laughs) Yeah, God. They are able to notice somehow that it's locked from the inside, uh, which is why they, you know, they're just bashing it open. But, uh, yeah, they they open it up and it just cuts ahead to the the narrator explaining that one day uh, just a completely deserted boat. Or, or cruiser was spotted. Mm-hmm. Uh, the crew completely vanished. There's just the leftovers of Dio's super casket and nothing else. Uh, th- this is when they uh, first describe the casket as having two compartments. Yes. Yeah. You see the the first compartment like lifted up. And uh, this this is all done over like a handheld camera. Like there's some shaking going on as the yes. camera just flies around and through this this boat. Uh, a very clearly like CG model uh, uh, boat. Yeah, yeah, it's... and that comes up a lot through this whole first episode. There, there is a lot of very mobile yeah. camera and and CG composite shots. Because Stardust Crusaders is probably like the most well known one. This anime has a bit more budget to work with than the other parts. Yeah, it it seems so... like a big hey, we're back, motherfuckers! Kick down the door. We're gonna flex on you with our CG uh, uh, shaky cam shit. And also later, CG environments, but with 2D characters. They, When the camera's panning, they're almost like uh, Paper Mario characters. Yes, yes. There, there's a lot of Mode 7 parallax that happens. Even in Episode yeah. 3, there's a really conspicuous one. Yes, yeah. It's like kind of goofy looking, but I like what they're trying to do with it. So, <laughs> uh, so, so yes, this boat has been abandoned and, and was forgotten because this occurred in 1983, long before true crime podcasts existed to yep. over-scrutinize anything vaguely mysterious. <laughs> so, yeah, the narrator says, yeah, just, it was a weird thing, but quickly forgotten within a few months. That, we go to uh, Japan, camera flying by the big uh, Tokyo Tower, mm-hmm. I think it is. The, the really cool big red tower is kind of like the Eiffel Tower. Panning over now to uh, a jail, and we've got uh, two cops uh, reading off the, the rap sheet of Jotaro Kujo, mm-hmm. our new Jojo. They explain that uh, his friends call him Jojo and that it is squishing together uh, syllables from his first and last names. Thank you for explaining how the name Jojo works. <laughs> yeah. It's only the third one. I've been so confused <laughs> up till now. Huh. 
Jotaro's dad is a jazz musician currently on tour, so you'll never have to worry about seeing Jotaro's dad because he basically doesn't exist. Instead, we get his mom, Holly Kujo, the daughter that we saw in our, our last episodes, you know, sort of where are they now segment as a little girl mm-hmm. is now all grown up with a, a teenage delinquent of her own. <laughs> Holly looks a pretty similar to, to Susie Q. Her oh mom. yeah, <laughs> uh, and she's personality-wise very similar she, to Susie Q. She's too, her mother's she's, daughter. Absolutely, she's basically a clone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's very ditzy, not like <laughs> super bright. Very cheerful, uh, and she is convinced her son has murdered a man, at least one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's super worried. By the way, also the cops, when they're explaining how the the name JoJo works, after they explain that, they one cop says to his other friend with a very strange haircut, that's pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're yeah. reading off this rap sheet. They seem very proud of him for street fighting, you know, taking it to, to the tops. Yeah. Oh, we wish we could get down there and also pulverize men's balls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and crush them into powder. Yeah, Jotaro didn't kill anybody, but he sent all of them to the fucking hospital. They were apparently all armed with nunchucks and knives, and he just fist fought all of them. W- one of them was a former boxer. He broke 15 of their bones between all these people, and yeah, <laughs> crushed their balls. Every last one. <laughs> Like he that made a point think, of it. Is that Jotaro's finishing move? Or <laughs> was that just like, okay, I beat all these guys up pretty good. They're all on the ground, you know, writhing in pain. And just to cinch it, I'm going to walk one by one and just crush all their balls just to make sure that they really don't get back up. It's his calling card. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> when he moves on to killing people in the street, they will know it's him. Yeah, yeah. It's like how Caesar's calling card was beating people with a wrench. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the the cops just are telling holly like okay this isn't a big deal keep him you know we're get, we're gonna release jotaro to you just you know make sure he doesn't get into any more street fights where he beats four men and crushes their balls <laughs> so uh, yeah we're, we're getting this as like a, a walk and talk through you know the hallways going down the stairs and there is like constant like shifting between the background and foreground and the camera itself it, it makes this really dynamic but also very yeah. uneasy like you're, you're not grounded some something's coming around the corner sort of sense yeah you know holly gets she she's just still so worried about jatara that she just runs ahead of the cops to go see him and we're seeing we're getting f- like flashbacks in her mind of memories of Jotaro, of him being little and growing up mm-hmm. to, to his current age. Uh, and in every single memory she has of Jotaro, he's a very nice boy. Yeah, yeah. She's reminiscing about the good times before he was the nut crush killer. <laughs> But also because of the way Holly acts, you know, she's very, uh, she's very cheerful, very, very ditzy and stuff. Is this just how she views Jotaro in her mind? And he's never been. <laughs> because the way, the way you see her interact with Jotaro through the thing, does she think her giant, you know, delinquent son has just been a very nice boy this whole time, even though he's probably been very mean his whole life? <laughs> <laughs> These all just like manufactured memories. She's got. I, I, don't I would love that. He's actually scowling. He, he's like torturing squirrels in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, but she I just don't think, like oh, what Jotaro nice at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jotaro's. Uh, he grows on you, but not so much because like, oh, he okay, he's cool. Actually, I mean, you know, like ah, I I like his personality. It's just more like, damn, this is the guy who punches really fucking good. <laughs> And, and like, by, by the end of the third episode, I start getting to that point. But, like, talking about the his introductory moments, he's, yes. he sucks so bad. I hate him. Yeah, Jotaro is, uh, th- like how Joseph was a, a, a big change from Jonathan, Jotaro is the same way. Uh, because as soon as uh, Holly gets to the cell, Jotaro's first line to his mom is, shut the hell up. You, you're you so damn annoying, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he calls his mom a bitch multiple times in these first three episodes. It's his catchphrase. <laughs> but also, like, he, he, he shouts, like, shut the hell up, mom, and Holly's reaction is to go, okay. <laughs> I love her. She's great. Yeah. I want this show to yeah. be about Holly. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, Get out of my face, you bitch, is the last thing either previous JoJo would ever say. <laughs> yeah. Like, especially Joseph. Like, imagine him saying at the Granny Arena, no way. He'd kill himself for saying that. <laughs> right? Like, right? Like, he'd beat himself up. 
Jonathan could never uh, say something so uncouth. He's never said a swore <laughs> swear in his life. <laughs> Jonathan never said the word heck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. While Joseph is, yeah, he he's like an objectifying horn dog. But if you tried to explain to him that that's kind mm-hmm. of misogynist, he would not believe you. He would not accept that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And now, yeah, so, get on my face, you bitch. Said to his own fucking mother, I hate him. Yeah, so to to briefly describe what Jotaro looks like, uh, he, one, he's like 16 years old, I believe, the mm-hmm. cops said, and he's fucking huge. He's basically just as big as Joseph was. He's like 6'5", still pretty muscular, still not as big as like Jonathan, of course. No one can, can beat the original beefy boy. Even Joseph, I think, was broader than him uh, in in his first scenes, at least. But, like, yeah. I would say that Jotaro is the first JoJo that doesn't immediately remind me of the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting a little more slender as we go here. He's still tall enough, like, to be on the Dream Team, yes, but... <laughs> Yeah, he's in like a, a a school, his school uniform, it's all black, but he's accessorized a little bit. He's got some some fancy stylish belts that only seem to be there for the fashion statement. They mm-hmm. don't actually hold anything up. He's got uh, on his big, super stiff popped collar, uh, a giant golden chain hanging from, mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. one. Huge chain links, and uh, probably his like defining thing with his character design is he. So he's got his a black hat on, a black school cap. He's just put accessorizes like some gold medals on it, but the back of the hat is ripped off, and it blends perfectly with his hair, as if it's part of his hair. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, there are some shots where you can actually see like it throughout part three, where like his hat comes off, and yeah, the back has just been ripped off, so it blends in with his hair. But it kind of looks like it's, a swan. Like if you cut, yeah. if, if the swan stuck its neck way out to become the bill of the hat and, yeah, and the, yeah. the way his hair flares out is like the, the butt feathers. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, the art style has again changed a little bit from part two. Uh, one of the biggest defining like things of art, part three's art style is there's a lot of dudes whose shoulders Yes. Like the, their yes. their clothes, their their the shoulders are super padded and are taller than like uh where their shoulders actually end up. It's like their arms are action figure arms. <laughs> they look they look completely separated from the rest of their body. Everyone is smuggling Vespa tires uh uh in their yes. jackets everywhere they go. Like the the dominant uh, uh silhouette is the Metroid Prime 2 dark suit. <laughs> yeah, basic yeah, totally. And that's, like, the defining, like, if you saw just a single character in a void and go, what part from JoJo is this? Even if they were new, if they have those shoulders, you know it's part three. Mm -hmm. Because it's only part three that has And it's everybody. It's everybody cool. Like, I don't think the cops do it. Uh, uh, The the three stooges that uh, he's sharing his cell with don't. But everybody who you're supposed to think is cool. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much, yeah. After Jotaro calls his mom a bitch and says, shut the hell up, she goes, okay, that's when part the Stardust Crusaders title slams yes, on screen. Yes, yes. <laughs> There, there is a lot of like comedy in the edit, in the sound design. There, there is one joke in I think it's episode three. We'll get to it. It wouldn't be a joke if the soundtrack didn't drop. You know that is the the punchline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jotaro is saying that, you know, even though his mom has come to pick him up, he's not leaving his cell. Because he is cursed with a ghost. Yeah, he's got it. He thinks he's possessed by an evil spirit and he's afraid that he's going to keep hurting people. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> it's it's the ball busting ghost. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. Like he was saying he had to like actively try during his fight with those other guys to like not absolutely like just murder them because of this this evil ghost the the supernatural element comes faster every part yeah at this point we've reached where it comes even before the action starts yeah like this is if you're you're retelling the spider-man origin story and the first scene is peter parker going to the doctor and be like i don't know something fucking weird is going on with me (laughs) yeah 
Yeah, there, there are three other guys in the cell with Jotaro, uh, and they're absolutely terrified. They want to get transferred to a different cell. <laughs> when they're begging the cops to move them to a different cell, uh, Jotaro shotguns a beer mm-hmm. uh, that he suddenly has. Uh, you can see he suddenly has a whole bunch of other things in his cell with him. He's got like a radio. He's got an RC car. He, he's got the latest issue of Shonen Jump. Yes, literally Shonen Jump by name. <laughs> Yeah, and when you see him go to read the Shonen Jump, like, he doesn't pick it up. It just floats in the air into his hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's haunted by the spirit of some sort of college boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a a whole big swath of interest here. Mm -hmm. I mean... Damn, reading Shonen Jump and shotgunning a beer. That's the, the life, time. man. <laughs> That's pretty good. By the way, he shotguns the beer by stabbing the bottom open with a pen he also <laughs> he also has. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What a cool dude. I've never seen someone shotgun a beer so slowly, though. <laughs> he's he's savoring it for some reason. Yeah, he does he does savor it, yeah. It's a very small hole. The the cops are asking holly like hey is there something wrong like what wrong with your kid in the head or something like we don't buy any of this so uh jojo gets up to demonstrate okay i'll show you like my fucking evil spirit uh and how dangerous this thing is he gets up to the bars and you see a a ghostly arm Mm -hmm. just barely appear and reach out through the bars and grab the guard's gun which the guards do not see they just see this gun start to levitate yeah they don't see the arm at all And Jotaro goes, okay, check this shit out. Did you see my evil spirit? No? Okay, I'm going to shoot myself in the head. Uh, And as he he fucking fires a bullet at himself, point blank, the bullet just stops in midair, and this ghostly arm that is behind him just grab the bullet, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, instantly. Uh, He is at that awkward stage in a young man's life where a glam rocker ghost prevents him from shooting himself. (laughs) We've all been there. Yeah. Usually around somewhere, you know, 16, 19, you know, some people are late bloomers. Uh, I never got mine. Oh. It's, I'm really hung up about it. More than the the being short thing, just not <laughs> having my own gla- the the not having my own glam rocker ghost is uh Have you tried really shooting hurts. yourself in the head? Uh not yet. I'm terrified because I'm not sure if I'll have the glam rock ghost that catches bullets or the glam rock ghost that's a, a muscular pterodactyl. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with that, we go to the uh, the airport where uh, old man Joseph has just arrived. Well, and Holly's before there that, to... we we, uh, we should talk about this season's new eye catches. Oh, right. Yeah. To an episode, we're, we're getting uh, uh, some who's that Pokemon ass title cards. Yeah, where it's still just all in silhouette because we haven't been yeah, appropriately yeah. introduced to the, the new power of part <laughs> three. But they come with graphs to give you rankings and all of their the different stats that these things can have, these ghosts. Or they come uh, with nothing, like in this case, just blank. <laughs> all question marks for now. <laughs> like, like you were saying, Joseph Joestar Gramps ha- has arrived in the airport and he's abusing yet another stranger. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, he he just shoves another guy completely over to so he can rush over to Holly who's there to to greet him. Once in his departure airport and now at his arrival, mm-hmm. he should not be allowed <laughs> to fly. This man is a menace. <laughs> it does seem that Joseph has is cursed uh when it comes to planes cuz when he was young, you know, that plane he was on got fucking hijacked and all that shit. Mm-hmm. So, I it's just they don't work well with Joseph Joestar. <laughs> I just hope he wasn't flying this one. That's when things go really bad. So uh, Joseph is in a new getup now. He he's got kind of an Indiana Jones thing going. Yeah, he, he's a safari man. Now. Yeah, got a, a big hat. He's got a, a long kind of like duster or trench coat. Very khaki, khaki all over. Yeah, he is khaki all over. He's got a big red gem brooch on his black turtleneck. I wish it was a bolo tie. <laughs> I want to see him rock a bolo tie. He would. It, it's nice to see Joseph because, you know, in contrast to Jotaro, old man Joseph is mostly pretty nice unless his foreigners that he wants to push over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his daughter is there to meet him. She rushes over, uh, exceeds her, her dad's time limit on hugs. He's, he tries to be very strict on this, but he just can't say no. She, she like starts tickling him in public and he starts screaming and... And he gets the clicky fingers. <laughs> 
Yeah, he gets the clicky fingers. He like his hands are gloved now, so you can't see the robot hand, but he's still got it. You hear it click whenever he moves it. All of Japan is staring at this clicky finger tickle fight. <laughs> it's very unusual. <laughs> Joseph already knows has already heard about the uh the whole evil spirit thing going on with Jotaro, and he's very concerned about this. And he seems to have a theory. He knows more than he's letting on. Yeah, he's trying to get some more info from Holly. So he's like, okay, you can't see it, but he claims he has one. Okay, I got a good idea. We're going to go straight to the jail and, and get this whole mess sorted out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so back at the jail, uh, Jotaro has continued to turn his cell into a dorm room. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's got even more stuff. He's got the RC car now. He's got a little end table. He's got like a Palm Pilot <laughs> thing, PDA or something. A whole bunch of books. This is a good uh, ghost you got. It's a great ghost, yeah. Uh, so Joseph arrives, he continues to just hate cops. Some things never change. Yeah, he just shoves these cops aside. By the way, just completely dwarfing the cops. He's like a foot and a half taller than <laughs> these dudes. That's right, he doesn't even push them away. He literally picks them up by the scruffs of their necks and just tosses them out of frame. <laughs> he don't give a fuck. Yeah, he is telling Jotaro, uh, come on, grandson, just get the fuck out of the cell. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. While uh, his grandson is like, shut the fuck up, old man. I am a disrespectful little <laughs> shit. That is my character. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and while saying that reveals that at some point he was able to rip off one of his grandpa's robot fingers. Mm-hmm. You know, Joseph's like, damn, his ghost is even like more powerful than I thought it could be. He ripped that finger off and I didn't even, <laughs> didn't even notice, didn't even feel it. Uh, but Joseph brought a friend. I guess Smokey was too busy running one city or another. I'm not sure, yes. I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so we meet Advil. Uh, I have to assume his name was Abdul in, in uh, originally. <laughs> uh, so, his, so his name is Mohammed Avdal. So in Japan, they don't have the B sound, so they substitute it with V. Mohammed Avdal is actually, uh, his name, namesake uh, uh, is owed to uh, Paula Abdul. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, both because, you know, uh, Voidberger, our guest in the last episode, mentioned that somebody would be named Paula Abdul. I was on the lookout for it. But also, it's one of the, like, default names for somebody for, from North Africa, as he is. Yes. This is a, an Egyptian man. Joseph uh, is just saying, like, okay, Avdol here, he's going to make you get out of this cell, mm-hmm. even if you don't want to. And that this is how they also use... Uh, they're, they're teaching Jotaro what his evil spirit actually is. Mm-hmm. Avdol has the, uh, uh, the same evil spirit attached to him, brings it out, and it is uh, a, a big, buff, naked man with a pterodactyl head mm-hmm. that is on fire. Always on fire. Constantly on fire. <laughs> Its name is Magician's Red, Mm -hmm. uh, and it just phases through the bars, and it just starts fucking wrapping Jotaro up in flame-like whips Mm -hmm. and just suspending him to the the, the wall and stuff. The cops can't see this shit. Holly can't see see this shit. They look at the thermometer, and it's about to explode because it's so hot in here now. Yeah, they're freaking out, and someone shouts, Zip it, pig. I'm not sure who, but it would fit any of their characters. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, everybody has their problems, but you probably shouldn't hire psychic mystic warriors to put your estranged grandson in the hospital. I don't think <laughs> that is the first step on the path toward healing. Uh, yeah, Magician's Red uh, attacking Jotaro here forces uh, Jotaro to like completely bring his evil spirit out. Uh, and it is, as you described, a glam rocker. It is a big, buff, purple man with a red scarf, golden sh- uh, shirt pauldrons, and a face kind of like Jotaro's, but more angular, a little less human-looking, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and just just 80s metal hair. <laughs> and fingerless gloves with lots of metal studs uh, on the back and knuckles. Oh, yeah. That's right, yeah. His evil ghost reaches out and, and grabs the magician's red by the throat, and you can see on Avdol... You can. It looks like he has been the one grabbed, like by the throat. You can see the imprint of mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the the fingers on his throat. So that, that's a good bit of like show don't tell into the mechanics. Yeah, all right. Yeah, and any damage that your ghost is taking, you are going to take as well. So Joseph starts explaining what exactly the these things are. They are called stands because they are ghosts that stand next to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Perhaps they don't stand so close to you. <laughs> Abdal's saying, like, hey, okay, this this stand J- Jotaro has is uh, way stronger than I thought it was going to be, and if you want me to, like, actually get him out of this jail cell, I might just have to throw him in the fucking hospital. <laughs> Here I go. I'm going to beat up your grandson. 
<laughs> and Joe's is like, fine by me. <laughs> All right. It takes what it takes, buddy. Go for it. Yeah. Is this cathartic for Joseph? Because it seems like he's been, Jotaro has been a little shit his whole life, maybe. So <laughs> just putting him in his fucking place for a second here with his friend's buff pterodactyl stand. So, uh, yeah, Magician's Red starts choking out uh, Jotaro's stand, which therefore, you know, starts choking out him as well. And we learned that even stands are to a degree breath powered. <laughs> we can't get past this. Yeah. Okay. It, it's It's more just, I think, hey, if you pass out, from lack of oxygen, your ghost can't do shit. Okay, probably. okay. Stands are breath powered in the way all fighting is breath powered, not necessarily Basically. the specific way Hamon is breath powered. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, he's being choked out with, with this like flame whip over his face. Uh, Jotaro's like, okay, I'm going to get serious about this too. And he kicks the table that's behind him. So it goes flying into the toilet and causes the toilet water to to spew everywhere. Another great tracking shot of a a CG animated model. Yeah. Yeah, that shot's cool uh, of watching the the table fly across the cell. uh, Before this water splash, you know, puts Magician's Red, the firebird. Ah, I see what you did there. uh, On the Uh back foot, Avdol is pressing the advantage and, and he mentions, you know, Aesop's fable, the North Wind and the Sun, to talk about the power right. of heat. Right. Uh, God, that is that. not what the story is about. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. It's a short one. Uh, basically, th- the North Wind and the Sun are arguing about, you know, who is more powerful, and the Sun's like, okay, see that guy down there? Whichever one of us can get him to take his cloak off first is is the stronger. Uh, you go first. Mm. So the North Wind blows and blows as... as Hard as it blows, uh, the the man just keeps clutching his cloak tighter and tighter. And then the sun just makes things pleasant. And and with a a nice gentle warmth, the the dude, like, sits down, relaxes, and takes off his cloak for a nap. And the sun wins. So the the, uh, lesson you're supposed to take is, uh, you know, the power of gentle persuasion. Mm. But the lesson you should actually take that I think really does apply is that you win fights by determining the win condition of a fight. Mm, okay. Because that is exactly what happens here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joe Taro is, is getting pissed, and you know, after extinguishing some of those flames, he pulls his stand out and just tears two of the bars off of the the jail cell door. They're very sharp and pointy, and he's going in to just fucking stab <laughs> stab this dude mm-hmm, with these mm-hmm. bars. And to do so, he steps outside the the jail cell, and Avdol's like, "Bam! He got out. I win. That was the rules." <laughs> Yeah, and then the, the fight's <laughs> over. He just immediately puts his stand away. He he just sits down. I like Avdol. Yeah, yeah, this is good. To, also, to to describe Avdol's look real quick, uh, also super tall, huge guy. It goes without saying. <laughs> Basically, uh, he's wearing kind of like a white robe, and he's got a, a kind of a long red jacket over it, big purple scarf, kind of turban or bandana. He's got like... They're not really dreads. His hair are is coiled up into tall cylinders all over his head. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and he has a what I thought for the longest time until this rewatch and Voidberger pointed it out to me. He looks like he's wearing a big golden necklace made of like giant big golden uh, medallions. They are not a necklace. They are earrings. They don't go around his back. They're connected to his ears. <laughs> uh, never noticed that. And he's got like big like metal bracelets or or like bangles going up his arms too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah jotaro's out he lost <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We, we get another uh, uh of those interstitial title cards this time there's information in it because it's about magician's red yeah at least on my end the netflix uh uh version of this does not translate what the the stats are <laughs> no at all no I'm actually going to real quick just bring up the the Crunchyroll version that just <laughs> translates the stats. Crunchyroll so loves to just slap translations of text onto objects. It's great. Yeah. Keep your hands off Isaacin is a tr- visual treat. <laughs> like, oh yes, that's a really good show. I like that show a lot. But the, the scenes with like a thousand things written that they all have to uh, be translated on screen. It's oh boy, so, some of those shots are yeah. a mess. Yeah. Oh, even the even the Crunchyroll ones don't don't translate the stats. Actually, damn. Huh. Let me. It's got to be on the wiki, right? Uh the wiki doesn't even list Wamu's favorite color. I think you'll. That's find. true. You're you're right. Actually, that's uh, it could be missing. No, damn. Even the wiki doesn't seem to have the fucking stats. I'm gonna have to at some point just look up what what the the individual stats are. Yeah, no one's no one's fucking put these down. Are you kidding me? 
I'll have to find these later. <laughs> yeah, whenever the stats come up for stands in the interstitial things, they are um they do try to get them as close to what the actual abilities of those stands are <laughs> in the show. I forget if it gets explicitly stated at some point or not, but basically the way stands work is it's a sliding scale of power. If you're really good in one thing, you're going to have to lose power in another thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's just kind of the general rule for the most part. If you got a stand, it can only be so good at one thing without sacrificing power elsewhere. When we're going through this, we'll learn the nature of how stands work a lot more. It's definitely more consistent than Hamon ever was. <laughs> but I also think that's because stands are probably the best power for Araki to work with because it's different for every person. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. if he's ever got a crazy idea or wants to change the rules, it's a lot easier because it's an individually based power. Right, right. And there are some like fairly consistent rules that work for all stands, but... We'll get to those in later episodes. Yeah, now that uh, Jotaro's out of his cell, uh, they just all go out for coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Joseph uh, continues to stand up for ladies, specifically his beloved daughter. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's one thing I like about old man Joseph is that uh, from the get go, there's an immediate sense that he loves being a dad. Mm -hmm. He really does. He's a good boy. She's such a good mom. For such a bad boy. For a bad boy. He's a bad boy. For a bad boy. In many ways. He's not just a bad boy. He's a bad boy. Yeah. But yeah, now that everyone's just chilling out at this cafe, Jotaro's asking Joseph, like, how did you know about my my evil spirit or my stand or whatever it's called? I don't know how anyone could know about this crazy shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jotaro goes out of his way to to start explaining all this stuff and saying, like, okay, every the reason why I came here... All this has to do with the lineage of the Joestar family. Throws down some Polaroids of the, the boat from the beginning of the episode and pictures of the, the of Dio's empty casket mm-hmm. and, and starts explaining, you know, the history of part one, essentially. What, everything that Joseph could possibly know, at least, of what happened right, right. on that boat with Jonathan and Dio. Basically, we, we've got our world-saving action story, but it is mm-hmm. joined with a family drama about abandonment and resentment. Yeah. Because new JoJo doesn't give a, a, a lick about his family history. Because where is, you know, family when he needed him? Like, it it seems very modern. Like, 1990 or so feels like the first wave of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Jotaro, growing up in Japan his whole life, there's basically been no other, like, Joe stars to see him mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. throughout his life for the most part. Cause, uh... Like what, he's going to listen to anything his mom says? <laughs> yeah and joseph has like continued to live in new york for his whole life and in fact in the english dub you know he's older he's got a different voice actor for being old he doesn't have an accent anymore mm-hmm. he's become americanized <laughs> yeah and and something i should bring up uh that's exclusive to just the japanese dub because he's like hella american now even though his voice acting is all done in japanese if he ever swears, it is always in English, and it's really funny with the Japanese voice actor. He, anytime there's a, there's a lot of holy, there's a compilation video out there just the, the Japanese voice acting of every time Japanese Joseph shouts "Oh my God" or "Holy shit," <laughs> and it's a lot. He swears a lot in Stardust Crusaders. It's pretty funny. What would his grandpa think? Oh, oh no, the shame. But yeah, Joseph is explaining who Dio is to. Jotaro explaining how the Joe stars are fated to fight Dio. Mm-hmm. We have to put an end to this dude. Jotaro just does not give a fuck. Yeah, well, psh, all right, sucks to be you then. <laughs> yeah, he basically just like sighs and rolls his eyes, and that get, that makes Joseph really pissed off. I, I think his line is, "This face means that was so stupid. I don't know what to say, Gramp." <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is time for yet another stand reveal. Uh, there, there's a reason yes. Joseph knows so much about the, these stands. He has one himself. And only recently obtained one. Yeah. It was only within the past couple of years he suddenly got a stand. I don't know. And like, okay, we've had two beefy punch boy stands. It is time to, to throw a wrench in something completely different mm-hmm. uh, to, to show the breadth of this concept, which is that uh, uh, Joseph slams down a... a what was it 30,000 yen Polaroid camera? <laughs> yes, a very, like a $300 camera. <laughs> and then karate chops it after some glowing vines encircle his hand. 
Mm-hmm. And that that is the power of his stand. He can do spirit photography. And once it uh, uh, develops, it will be a vision of, of something important. And all of his visions have been of Dio. <laughs> Yeah, he keeps just getting more and more Polaroids of Dio. Not great pictures of him. He's kind of in shadow, facing away from the photo. But yeah, when he hands the, the photo over to Jotaro, who's very impatient, cannot wait for uh, you know a Polaroid to take a couple of seconds to develop. It, does the stand check the price tag? Can it be on sale? Does it not work if it's uh, if the discount is too steep? <laughs> I wonder. So this is a th- this is a thing that gets established a little bit more later on. It's kind of sort of a rule change to how Joseph stands work, but it's not like it's not really bullshit. It makes sense, mm-hmm. but it's not so much just expensive cameras. It's any visual medium he can do spirit photography through. It's just getting pictures, photos is like probably the most convenient thing because you get to keep them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um is the retcon then that joseph first did it with this model of camera and was like it must be this kind of camera i gotta buy up a thousand mm-hmm. of these <laughs> maybe yeah because there are some times later where he uses he uses stuff other than cameras to get uh, uh spirit photography but i don't know it makes sense yeah yeah Joseph is is asking Jotaro and Holly, hey, have you ever, like, you know, noticed your cool birthmark uh, <laughs> uh, on all of them, including Joseph? And you do see this in part two, actually. I pointed it out. Uh, you even see it in, in part the, one. The podcast. Yeah, you do see it in part one, actually. Yeah, every single Jojo has a big kind of like on their back, like kind of where their neck meets their shoulders, just a big star shaped birthmark. The trapezius, you might call it. <laughs> the trapezius, Yes. And yeah, so we get a shot, you, we, you see that they all have the same birthmark in about the same spot. And so does Dio. Yeah, in the photo. Because that's not his shoulder. That shoulder originally belonged to Jonathan Joestar. Yep, he is, he is fucking lopped Jonathan's head off and Dio's taken over Jonathan's gigantic muscular body. And it's still pretty huge. Jonathan's only victory was a 100 year delay. So tragic. Yeah, it sucks, man. Also, some, somebody disrespects a waiter in the middle of, of uh, this yes. expository exchange. Yeah, a waiter just comes by and goes like, hey, is everything going good? Can I get you anything? And everyone's just like, fuck off. Waiter is the worst job in the JoJo world. <laughs> Nothing good yeah. ever happens at a restaurant. If if dogs didn't frequently die, especially in this current part we're just start, starting, yeah, probably maybe one of the more consistent things is just waiters being disrespected. <laughs> They, Imagine they, being the busboy who has to clean up a wine glass with noodles stuck through it. Like, what What do I even do here? <laughs> I guess it's yeah. trash. There's nothing else you can do. So, yeah, Joseph is explaining it is their destiny to fight Dio and, and finish this fight that Jonathan wasn't able to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Avdal is, is explaining that, like, uh, in you know the wider world, anyone who's aware of stands who does not has one just regards our powers as, as being you know, psychic powers. Avdol has had his stand since birth, but Joseph and Jotaro only recently got theirs, mm-hmm. uh, which means that their their destiny it, it's the whole Japanese concept of like the red thread of destiny. Basically, uh, their their bodies are tied to the the bodies and destinies of previous Joe stars, and because Dio is now f- fused with Jonathan Jonathan's body, yeah, that, that uh, has somehow has... sent a ripple down the the bloodline. Yeah. Uh, and awoken yeah. stands in in our two JoJo's here. Joseph hands the the D, the new Dio photo over to Abdul and says like, "Can you suss out any information for this photo?" And it's just like it's too dark, it's too murky to like figure out a location mm-hmm. just based on this this single photo. Uh, so we cut over to Dio being very dark and very murky. <laughs> yeah, he's already got a, a big lavish bed to lounge on. He's just sort of monologuing, you know, as he does. <laughs> yeah. And and mentions that he just made the first move, which is interesting because it's not like Dio to, like, waste a few years lying around. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder how weak a hundred-year-old not being able to feed on anybody Dio is. Did he have to spend a whole bunch of time sucking people's life forces up to, to get back to normal? I imagine I a lot of stretching. That's what all the poses are. He's stretching. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, he's hanging out his evil vampire lair, and we do see he had just finished feeding on a lady uh, who's just laying dead in the ground. Dio seems cool with what's happening. Uh, he, he already says, you know, he's sent somebody to fuck the Joe Stars up for him <laughs> so he doesn't have to do anything. And that's the end of uh, the first episode. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, time for episode two, Who Will Be the Judge, which starts uniquely with a previously on intro. Oh, yeah. Yeah, JoJo doesn't really do that. But there was so much stuff, as you can tell from the runtime of this episode, to, to cover. <laughs> <laughs> God, oh, my God. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Good Lord. So, yeah, we do get that that recap. And then we uh, start the episode with Jotaro at his home, a really fucking nice estate, I gotta say. Yeah, it's like a, a super traditional Japanese estate, you know, uh, uh, the mm-hmm. paper walls, uh, raised uh, uh, floors, like. They, they they remind me of tiny baby balconies run, running around uh, yeah. all, all the rooms. I I guess jo, Jotaro's jazz musician dad must be pretty loaded. I guess it's man. a pretty nice house. He's playing some sweet gigs. But I think they have more than one building on their estate. They have a specific room for tea ceremonies. Yeah, they have a tea ceremony room. That must mean they're they're pretty loaded. I don't know. I don't know how many rooms you have to have to set aside a specific tea ceremony room, but it's more rooms than I've ever had in my life. So Jotaro's getting ready to go to school. I'm surprised he's even a good enough boy to go to school. I think you think he'd just play hooky every day. He says he doesn't do it often. Okay, that's true. Yeah. I do like the detail of Jotaro being so huge that he has to kneel to go under all the doors mm-hmm. in his house. <laughs> Uh, there's even a shot where he's just standing straight up right next to the door and it's like his forehead would just, <laughs> he's got inches over the, over these thresholds. But before he can leave, his mom come, you know, says, oh, wait, you know, don't leave yet. I got to give you a little goodbye kiss because she's the nicest mom ever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when she does that, Jotaro says, you bitch, stop clinging to your child already. <laughs> <laughs> you did, uh, Your mother is so kind and you do not deserve her. <laughs> And her response to that is just, okay, have a good day. <laughs> it's the best. I love her. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I was willing to forgive the first you bitch. Because like, okay, yeah. he's he's scared. He's confused. Mm. He's trying to like put on a, a, a brave face as he has no idea what's happening to, to himself or his body. Like, okay, once things calm down, no, fuck that. He just sucks. I hate him. <laughs> He's mean. He's a mean boy. So in the English dub, when he's walking away from his mom, he says, good grief. This is a translation of the catchphrase. So there's a lot of things in JoJo that like people just say the Japanese version of it because it has stuck a lot more than the English translations. Good grief is a translation of his Japanese catchphrase, which is yari yari daze. Good grief is kind of what it means. Uh, he says it a lot throughout the entire show. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's basically kind of a, um, like a, oh, geez, oh, well, well, well kind of thing, while also showing, like, you don't care that much. Just like, ah, <laughs> oh, geez, this is bullshit kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's kind of what it is. I guess good grief kind of works for that. Good grief has not stuck the way Yari Yari Daze has. So if you ever see that, that's what that is. Dismissive, kind of above it all filler phrase. Yeah, that's that's basically what it is, and he's he's gonna say it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but when when he gets to school, uh, you know, he, no matter where he goes, no matter the generation, there is some ladies fall, uh, fawning over him. Uh, sometimes seven at a time. <laughs> yeah, there's a big group of tiny schoolgirls. He's popular with the just, ladies. Uh, calm down, calm down. He sucks. He's not worth yeah, it. <laughs> they're all fawning over him, latching onto his arms. The ladies get into a fucking fight over him yes they get into an argument as he's Uh, telling them all to piss off yeah by the way one of these ladies has a really hilarious hairstyle that basically looks like she's wearing a cornucopia (laughs) like it's really asymmetrical (laughs) yeah and and on its side not like with her head in the hole like you might expect yeah yeah on the side Jotaro's getting annoyed at them arguing around him so he tells them to shut the hell up and then they just all go damn that dude's hot (laughs) It's like Jotaro. It's like Jotaro's cursed. Yeah, yeah. Like some some sort of very tricksy witch cursed him, so that what whatever tone of voice he used, women would hear it as the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's why his mom's memories are all of him as such a very nice, kind boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't understand how he could go out beating people when he's always so kind to her. <laughs> <laughs> so while uh, Jojo is being followed by all these ladies, uh, the camera cuts over a few feet away to a very ominous teenager painting Jotaro. I I think this painting is supposed to be like, you know, cubist, uh, uh, but I just see it as the Napoleon Dynamite Liger drawing. (laughs) Yeah, it is kind of like that, huh? 
<laughs> so while this guy is, is is painting Jotaro here, Jojo starts going down a very long, steep set of stairs. And this guy paints a, a red line across the, the leg of Jojo. And suddenly, real Jojo has just... His fucking, leg explodes. His leg explodes, a huge burst of blood. He trips. He f- starts falling down this really steep set of stairs. He's about to, like, fucking eat it. Yeah, this staircase is about three stories tall. And he is yeah. uh, uh, going for the ground, not further down the staircase, as one might expect. He's been yeah. launched. But he's able to save himself. He... he sends out just the the arm of his stand to grab some tree branches and he's able to swing on those and land safely and all, all the girls are very concerned this brings me back to my high school days when seven girls followed me <laughs> everywhere i went desperate for my attention oh yeah oh. i miss those days as well yeah <laughs> uh, but but somewhere in here we we get our first look at the the part three op Oh, yes, we do with this episode. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it starts with a legacy of the JoJo's. So is this the the double Zeta of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? We, we have to go through the oh, previous man. protagonist to, to see the new one. Yeah. Yeah, we get a, we get poses from Jonathan, then young Joseph, and then now uh, Jotaro. And the rest is all basically a road trip with the homies. Several homies we haven't yeah. yet met, but it is a road trip with the homies. Mm-hmm. This... OP also brings in some elements from the part one OP. We get uh, similar shots of like an evil fog going up uh, a set of stairs that leads up to Dio posing. We get uh, the like comic book onomatopoeia motif again Mm because there's a part mm -hmm. where everyone's just fighting and and flying through tons of sound effects and, and comic book style elements. And we also get a callback to the the first OP of Jotaro and Dio falling through, just falling endlessly through a, a tower like uh, Jonathan and Dio falling through the 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 Joestar estate that was on fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, except now Dio is like completely in silhouette and you can barely see him as, as Jotaro is trying to punch him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really cool OP. It looks really good. Back to the present, uh, this mysterious painter is is musing about how, ooh, um, <laughs> such quick reactions. He, he truly is a powerful stand user. Like, you could have just cut his throat, you know? You, that yeah, that you red slash of paint could have gone anywhere. You chose just <laughs> below the knee for some reason. That was your decision. Yeah. I do like when this painter is coming down the, the stairs because he's, like, voguing super hard. He's got this super long scarf wrapped around his arm. And just looking real sassy mm-hmm. when he's doing it. Uh, but he hands Jojo uh, a handkerchief to like clean up the blood. Which he does he not kinda, do. <laughs> he doesn't do. He does keep the handkerchief. He just pockets he it and it. walks the fuck away. <laughs> so th- this painter guy uh, is in... Uh, he's from a different school. He's in a different school uniform. It's it's green. It's like yellow buttons on it. And uh, he's got kind of long red hair. He's got a face like a upside down pyramid. He comes to a point, yeah. this boy. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of dudes have that kind of face in part three, super angular. The Whenever they're drawn like from a, a three-fourths angle, the, the further away part of their face is basically just a straight line. There's no cheekbones or anything. It's just a line. You could scalp him and use his head as a funnel. Yeah. I don't know why you, you'd want to, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy, you know, basically just keeps being kind of vaguely threatening and then just walks away. Uh, and the, the girls know him. His name is Kakyoin. And they are all about him, but not as much as they're all about Jojo. <laughs> yeah, they're they're ranking the boys right in front of Jojo here. And with that, uh, we cut over back to Dio, reliving memories of the, the boat mm-hmm. and him just being ahead and going like, damn, it really sucked being ahead. I hated that. <laughs> uh, and then he like rubs his hands all over his body and flexes so hard that sweat in slow motion just flies all over the camera. Uh, and goes like, but damn, I love Jonathan's body. It's pr- it's great. Mm-hmm. Come on, come on. How is there not subtext to damn, I love Jonathan's body? Yeah, right. Come on. Like, the way that whole part is framed, where he's running his hands over the, all over the body, is pretty sexual. Yes, like, yes, it is. Like it is super sexual. <laughs> yeah, he is. He he starts monologuing again, talking about how like the Joe stars are aware of his his existence and he needs to take care of him quick before they can find him mm-hmm. uh, while he's doing this we do see dio has some lackeys he's got they're, they're a, still a couple shadow. of minions in just such deep inky shadow there's really nothing to say about them i mean you can barely tell they exist 
Yeah, they're just there in the background. He looks at himself in the mirror, and I, I keep forgetting that vi- vampires can see themselves in reflections in the world of JoJo. It would be wild um, if there was just a headless body in the mirror. Oh my god! That would be so great. Oh, that would have been rad. But yeah, now we go back to uh, Jotaro's house. Joseph and Avdol are in the tea ceremony room, and Joseph is immediately bitching how, about how tiny the rooms are in Japan. Well, maybe if you weren't a are. muscle giant freak. <laughs> okay, you've got good genes, fine, but still. And, and, and Joseph's just whining about this while Avdol's like doing the, the tea ceremony. He goes, just like, I don't know, it's pretty soothing. I like the tea ceremony. <laughs> and... Uh, Joseph, I really like this bit. Joseph's just like, fuck this. I love American instant coffee. And he starts blending that. And then uh, he says it sucks because Japanese coffee is bad. And Abdul reminds him, that's the American coffee you brought. That, and he's so American. grumpy about it. <laughs> yeah. I want to be racist. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, you know, while they're having their coffee and tea here, they're talking about Dio trying to figure out like where to even start with trying to figure out where Dio is and like, Oh shit, does Dio have a stand too? like, what the fuck are his powers going to be? And they're, they're real worried about that. Mm -hmm. Jotaro now has gone to the nurse's office to get his, his leg fixed up. There are also two other high school boys here that are also equally fucking as big and looking (laughs) like they're 30 years old gangsters. Uh Um, They got pompadours and stuff. They're they're faking being sick so they don't have to go to class. And uh, and the school nurse, like this is honestly one of the biggest differences between the, the subtitles and the dub is that uh, yeah. uh in the subtitles she's a nurse, in the dub she's a doctor. Right, a doctor, yeah. I don't know the point of that change. <laughs> I don't know. Cause the, the Or which one's more accurate to the source, honestly. I don't I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. The part one and two, their subtitles are accurate to the English dub. But here for part three, the subtitles were the original ones done for the Japanese one. I wonder if maybe they change it from nurse to doctor just because of the difference in syllables. I don't know. Oh, could be. Uh, Could be. Frequently, I think that if a word gets changed for a dub and it's like, why did why did you change that when the other word was also fine? I think it's for lip flap reasons, usually, maybe. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But in any case, she is an old hand at dealing with fakers like these two. But oh boy, uh, uh, Jojo here has a real wound that needs real attention. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, uh, I think the hottest babe in all of Jojo so far. Yeah, the nurse is really hot for some, <laughs> for some reason. Her and Lisa Lisa. Yeah, uh, yeah. I could buy these these 30-year-old gangster delinquents faking being ill just so they could see the stacked nurse again. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> She uh she's trying to like cut off Jojo's pant leg, uh, but he's just like, "Don't fuck up my pants. I'll just take them off." And when he's going to do that, she goes to attend to the the other fakers, and Jotaro pulls out the handkerchief that Kakioin gave him and opens it up and uh reveals that there's actually a murder re- message written <laughs> written inside of this it. This just brings me back to my high school days, passing secret notes with death yeah. threats. <laughs> yeah, there, there's just a fucking death threat in this handkerchief, like in between. Uh, you know, being chased by all those girls and us uh, uh, reading zany VG quotes during physics class. Yeah, we were. this was happening all, <laughs> all the time. The time. P- people were just jealous of how many marshmallows you could eat at once. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Uh, oh, God. That was a bad day. That was a good bad day. <laughs> it was a good bad day. I mean, I felt I was worried when you accidentally swallowed one marshmallow whole because there were too many in your mouth at once. <laughs> and I thought you were going to choke to death. <laughs> Uh, the good it thing it was a marshmallow. So slimy. Oh yeah, that must have been fucking gross. That looked nasty, man. <laughs> but while Jojo is like reading this note and going like, "Oh shit," uh, he looks back over his shoulder, and the nurse is acting real weird now. She's foaming at the mouth. <laughs> she's yeah, she is fo- foaming at the mouth. Her eyes have rolled up at the back of her head. She's grabbed a uh, like a a real nice fountain pen that looks it's supremely sharp, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and she's just swinging it around and being real threatening. She, she's, uh, she's just stumbling around. No, no real sense of balance. Jojo briefly notices there's some weird gray and green tentacle like going up her leg. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. The nurse is acting like the, uh, the the pen is still a thermometer, and she's like, "Okay, time to take your temperature." And she just stabs one of the dudes clean in the eye and starts twisting the the pen in his eyeball. School staff is so overworked these days. You know, if if she yeah. could just have a, a break, maybe if they hired a, a second nurse. And here we get another interstitial again. Not a lot of stands have been revealed yet, so we just get a silhouette of what Kakioin's stand is. 
Uh, just all a whole lot of question marks. marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Why wasn't it Joseph's? Like it, it hasn't been named, mm. but we could at least see it with a picture now and and some of its abilities. Yeah. We've seen it ha- yeah. use abilities. But yeah, the, those two guys. Somehow the guy being stabbed inches deep into his eyeball with a fountain pen is still alive. It's the twisting that gets me, honestly. Oh, the twisting Dude, is the bad. The twisting is bad. So yeah, he both those guys run out. They they just run away. And so the nurse turns her attention to Jojo here and stabs him in the cheek with the fountain pen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, super strong. He can barely hold her back. But uh, he, he sees, uh, he spies Kakyoin with a, a little wooden marionette. Yeah. Because he is using the power of his stand uh, to control the nurse and make her a deadly opponent because to harm the stand would harm this this uh, frail nurse. And this is a trick that he learned from ACDC. Uh, <laughs> go ask yeah. Grandpa about it, JoJo. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a gross shot of uh, when JoJo's trying to fend off this this lady and she's you know, her mouth is hanging open and you can see the stand just like in her throat, just peeking out. Oh, yeah. It's bad. It's uh, bad. It's it's gross. So as as she stumbles around, her shirt just falls open <laughs> just uh-huh. cuz. Yep. <laughs> Sex and violence baby got to sell those issues. <laughs> uh-huh. So Jotaro goes in to like to 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 kiss her, but what he actually did was use his stand to also kiss her and bite down on the stand in her mouth and rip it out of her. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which that part, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's, that's a, that's a Joseph move. That's pretty tricksy. Yeah. Also forcing yourself on a woman. That's a Joseph move. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. He would just like fantasize about it. Okay. That's, that's true. He would just fantasize about it. Boy, I sure it. wish the wind would flip up those skirts. If only I had wind powers. Oh, wait. <laughs> he never made that connection. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, now, now like the the stand, if the stand's still kind of like in the lady. It's only been pulled halfway out of her. It's just from like the waist. It's up. like a tapeworm. Okay, it's it's um green and chrome. It's it's like uh yeah, it's some sort of gooey cyberpunk uh, uh, aesthetic. Uh, yeah, but it just trails off for for feet and feet and feet and feet into into like yeah a tapeworm style tail that that is still bound to to the doctor nurse. So yeah, he's mostly like a gooey guy, but he's got kind of like a yeah, like a cyberpunk like style head. He's got like a kind of a weird breathing apparatus around its mouth and it's got like um oh, what are those lights called? It's got like robot eyes mm-hmm. kind of that that would be used on like um Android Kikaider or whatever, like like old Sentai style like cyborgs with the like vertical lines going over like the the eyeballs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um like tail lights. Like tail lights, kind of like that. Yeah, as Jojo is still holding out to the stand, he's just like, this, I don't know, this stand looks pretty lame. I'm going to beat the shit out of you now, dude. <laughs> but before he can do that, uh, Kakyoin's stand pulls out his like main signature move, which is Emerald Splash, which is from his hands, he shoots a whole bunch of Chaos Emeralds at you. <laughs> <laughs> and and it hits uh, Jojo's stand square in the chest, which therefore hits Jojo square in the chest. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the Matrix rules. What What happens actually happens. Yeah. Uh, and, and Kakyoin informs him that his insides have been torn to shreds. Oh, yeah. I don't think this nurse's office is equipped to deal with insides torn to shreds. Mm, no. So Kakyoin actually names his stand here. It's Hierophant Green. Mm-hmm. Kind of got like a tarot card yes, thing going yeah. on here. Now that there are two named, or or uh, three, we, we forgot to, to mention that uh, Joseph's is Hel- Hermit Purple. Yeah, so kind of tarot cards with With, with, with a color, yeah. And while he's explaining like how a stand, you know, works and and can you know remote control people, manipulate things, and uh, you know if, if it's inside somebody and is forcefully removed, that person gets hurt. As he says that, the nurse just explodes, <laughs> just blood fucking explodes everywhere. She's still somehow alive, but she is bleeding all over the place. Yeah. So of course, Kakuin does the the classic villain thing. You know, this is your fault, Jojo. I taped yes. a gun to your hand and, and uh, <laughs> uh, pointed it at the lady, and it's your fault for pulling the trigger that I made you do with a string. This is your fault, Jojo. Yeah. So Jojo gets up. He He's such a beefy, strong boy. He's still able to get up despite having sh- shredded insides, I guess, and starts explaining basically his code of ethics. Yes. He's a bad boy. He's a punk. 
He beats people up, even if they just look at him the wrong way. He's beaten up teachers that teach, teach him a lesson, and they just haven't, they've just quit their jobs. He fucking dine and dashes. If he doesn't like food, he just gets up and leaves and doesn't fucking pay. <laughs> so even he knows he sucks. <laughs> and that's how he knows what true evil is. You're the bad guy here. <laughs> yeah. He, he, you know, he, he's explained evil is when you use uh, the weak for your own gain and all this stuff, especially if it's a, like, you know, a woman or a weak ch- uh, a child or an elderly person. He, he, he points at Kakyoin and is saying, you know, I might not be the greatest guy, but I know bad people when I see it. And because your stand is invisible to the law, I'm going to be the one to judge you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, his, his uh, uh, big purple friend comes out <laughs> oh, and yeah. winds up for a punch. It's incredible. I love it. His hand is pulled back. Uh, the fist is not yet made. No, no. Every finger individually gets folded into the fist with this chunk, 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 chunk. Yeah, it's like he's loading up a gun or it's something so, with each finger. It's so good. Like... Yeah. Anticipation is one of the most powerful principles of animation. <laughs> yeah. It's like like you go back to like the nine old men shit with squash and stretch, blah blah blah. Anticipation is where it's at. Yeah. And this is like, one of the greatest examples. <laughs> yeah, like Kakyoin is still really cocky. He fires more another emerald splash at, at at Jojo, but he's able to just like now that he knows it's coming, he just puts his arms up and just shrugs all of them off and just, you know, flings them elsewhere. Yeah, Ka- Kakyoin is is trying to like propose a counterpoint that uh what what is justice man uh what, what's yeah. right is written uh, uh you know history is written by the winners motherfucker i'm gonna yep. tear you apart and that makes me the good guy in the end uh and like right before we get that really great bit where you know each finger closes individually to make the fist jojo with his stand grabs kakioin's stand uh hierophant green and just fucking by the neck and just fucking throttles him really fucking hard <laughs> just shakes the this dude by the neck and kakioin just starts puking blood everywhere while this is happening but man when he yeah you get the anticipation bit and when he punches hierophant green it's in slow motion and it looks so good you feel the impact so good like it's tail light eyeball cracks and shatters mm-hmm. he just starts pummeling this like he's still got him by the neck and he's pummeling this dude the hierophant green's head so hard it looks like a punching bag it's just f- shaking every which way oh, uh, oh and- it's really good so so we really this is where we get our debut uh, of jotaro as jojo right yeah and, and you know declaring that there is evil and he will fight it uh, uh, because it falls on him to do so in in this mystic realm against the claim that might makes right. You know, he's like, no, I, I yeah. Uh, also, he wins because he just punches better. At least in this case, <laughs> yes. The the yes, secret the, that he pulled out is uh, uh, his stand's chest is tougher than believed, and so his insides secretly weren't shredded. <laughs> yeah, I do like the finishing blow here. He tosses Hierophant Green up in the air and just punch does an uppercut in the head so hard it flies through the rest of the school and you get an outside shot of every single window of the school just immediately shattering (laughs) and everyone like a a shot of like other people just having a normal class just like freaking out because like half the school just exploded Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah with this fight establishing that like yeah Jotaro and his sand are just really fucking strong and just punch really fucking hard the beginning fights stand fights of part three are a little more just like I punch better than you or I figured out oh, an opening to punch you really hard. But it doesn't take too long for the part two style uh, stuff to start coming back in where, OK, it's not just I can't just punch this guy because his powers are way too fucking weird to just punch him. Mm hmm. And you start getting more of like the thought processes back and like the the really crazy like turning the table on the enemy in a clever way to beat them. That stuff starts coming back. But at the start, yeah, it's it is a lot of like Jotaro just punches really fucking good, man. Yeah, yeah. This also establishes our our brand new JoJo as you know square in the line of violent eighties antiheroes. Yeah, yep. uh, a- antiheroes are tied to periods of like social unrest, uh, especially rebellious youth. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I really see uh, Jojo as a cross between, like, Dirty Harry and JD from Heathers. <laughs> yep. Doing the Dirty, Dirty Harry thing, like, you're spot on because, like, in the first vol- hardcover volume that has some interviews with Araki at the end, Araki straight up says, like, yeah, I based Jotaro off of Clint Eastwood. <laughs> like, every character that Clint Eastwood plays, that's what Jotaro is based off of. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, he nails it. It's, it's He is exactly like a Dirty Harry style dude, yeah. 
Uh, that knee is still bleeding, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's still bleeding from the knee. He's still... And and Jotaro just, he, he checks on the, the, the nurse, and she's still alive. He's like, oh, her injuries should be fine, despite exploding from the inside from a giant tapeworm in her gut space. She's tougher than she looks, yeah. Yeah, she's fine. I, I mean, Kakyoin has con- uh, uh, repeatedly now underestimated people's guts. <laughs> yes, it's his fatal flaw there. <laughs> So Jotaro thinks, okay, I should get out of here before I get in trouble. <laughs> so he just picks up Kakyoin's unconscious body after he violently also exploded. And he just hops out a window and just walks walks off with them and takes him back to his home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We didn't say it, but yeah, Kakyoin straight up just admits like, oh, I am here to serve Lord Dio. I got to kill you for Dio's sake. Mm-hmm. But but back at, the, at Jotaro's home... Uh, Holly is just like cleaning and doing household chores, looks at a framed photo of Jotaro looking grumpy and hugs it thinking and says out out loud, oh, I bet he's thinking of me right now. (laughs) And then he comes up behind her with a bloodied, almost dead teenager (laughs) and just goes like, hey, mom, I'm not thinking about you. I'm looking for gramps. Yeah, where's grandpa? Please, Jojo, let's trade moms. You clearly don't want yours. She's so nice. That's something we have in common. We can trade moms. Holly seems like the mom who, like, even though Jotaro is 16, would still tucks him in at night. She tries. Or at least tries to. And also seems like the mom who is always giving him, like, milk and cookies mm-hmm, all the mm-hmm. time. He eats them. He's, he doesn't smile, but he will eat them when she's not looking. Yeah, while she's gone, he, he eats the cookies and, like, muffled just like, <laughs> Thanks for the cookies, though. <laughs> Also, also, I bet he shotguns the milk carton. He's a, he's a rude boy who drinks straight from the milk carton, and he drinks it from the bottom. <laughs> he's a bad boy. Bad boy. Quit doing that. Get out the spray bottle. <laughs> Quit doing that. So, so as uh, he, he walks away with his, his prisoner, I guess. <laughs> yeah, his prisoner of war. Uh, Holly keeps thinking to herself, "Oh, uh, he he talks tough, but I I know he he cares deep down." And then the music cuts, and he's like, "Hey, I don't care about you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, you look sick. Be careful. <laughs> the slightest ounce of show, ounce of showing that he cares is like, "You look pale today," and that's like enough proof for her to just be like ecstatic and and like strike a cute little pose and go like, "Thank you." <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, she she gives him a little peace sign. She's so happy to be thought of. Yeah. And like this is <laughs> this is a comedy beat. This is played for laughs and it's very funny, but if you take out the soundtrack that that sells the mm-hmm. joke, this is a cycle of domestic abuse. <laughs> Yeah, it just yes. straight up is. Yeah, uh, all, all we need is is for JoJo to be like, "No, I'm so sorry. I'll do better. I swear." Oh God, yeah, yeah. You get into that really shitty uh, manipulative behavior. Sure, I just love you so much. It makes me go crazy. <laughs> like, oh fuck yep. you. Uh oh. Oh, you got to leave. <laughs> Thank God, J- Jotaro never does that. But yeah, he 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 just dumps Kakyoin's body on the floor in the tea room. And, and Joseph gets real serious, goes like, okay, yeah, this guy is absolutely, definitely a servant of Dio, because take a look at this shit, and he lifts Kakyoin's bangs out of the way, and right on the very top of his forehead is like a weird, gross, little, fleshy mass. You gotta get that mole checked out, dude. It's it's gross looking. It's like pulsating and like screeching. <laughs> it makes an evil screeching noise. And that's the end of episode two. Mm-hmm. That's the end. Uh, also, like... The, the prognosis that they give Kakyo in, in episode two confuses me because like, yeah, mm-hmm. this dude is definitely dying. There's no way around it. He has a few days to live. Like, OK, come on. <laughs> yeah. If he can live for a few days before dying of his injuries, you have time to fix these injuries. Maybe not you, yeah. but a doctor. <laughs> At least try. Uh, so that, that brings us to uh, uh, episode three, The Curse of Dio, and they immediately start playing with his flesh bud in public. <laughs> Ew, don't do that. <laughs> it's gross. So yeah, the this thing is a, a flesh bud made of Dio's own vampiric cells, and he can just stick them onto anybody. Truly foul flesh. Yeah, g- gross flesh. Uh, and they, they like stab into the person's head and burrow into the person's brain, and now they are just a, a 
a servant of Dio. They they are controlled by this this flesh. Bud. Well, the way they explain it, it's not mind control per se, not directly. It is a brain spike that makes you especially susceptible to charisma. Right. Yes. And nobody yeah. has more charisma than Dio. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Joseph Strip just says Dio is just super charismatic. He compares Dio to a dictator mm -hmm. <laughs> or a cult leader. I I um, know some things about dictators. You know, one of my best friends, <laughs> <laughs> one of my other oh, best yeah. friends too, was ruled by a dictator and didn't seem to have any problems with it. Maybe in his fifty, maybe in these fifty years, Joseph has reflected on being friends with Stroheim and, and gone. Mm, that wasn't mm -hmm. a great phase of my life. Let's let's just hope he never really talked about uh, politics with Caesar much. Oh, <laughs> they God, had other yeah. things on their mind. <laughs> yeah. But somebody decides that it's been far too long without a flashback. So Advil has to tell us about the time he met Dio. Oh, yeah. In, in Egypt. This is like four months ago. Recently. Yeah. yeah in, in Cairo. So so Avdol is a fortune teller by, tra by trade. And he was going back to his shop at night and as he was getting up to the, going up the stairs to his shop uh dio is just there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh just chilling out in the shadows he describes his his dubious sensuality the kind you wouldn't expect from a man yes yeah and and then goes on to describe how he's so terrified of dio because he's so fucking hot we don't stand yes! a chance <laughs> Yeah, he's got, like, near-translucent alabaster skin. Like, you don't see Dio's face too much. He's still in shadow for the most part. But uh, there's lots of shots of just Dio's lips and him licking his lips. <laughs> going like, damn, damn, Avdol. You got a cool power right here. Want to work for me? And Avdol's like, but his hair is so silky. And his voice uh, ma makes me makes my heart skip a beat. We're fucked, guys. He's too fucking hot. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like uh, you see Dio's hair turn into weird tentacles to like inject the the flesh butt into Avdol. Avdol's reaction to this super hot guy is to scream and <laughs> jump out a window and run away. That's the only way I, he could get away, like deal with this super fucking hot guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's to yell and jump out a window. He surely would have fell to, to Dio if uh, uh, he weren't warned in advance by Mr. Joestar. <laughs> I wonder how uh, Joseph phrased that. Was it just like, hey, you're going to, there was a vampire about and he might try to find you. Or, hey, there's a really fucking hot guy. <laughs> Don't fall for his tricks. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it, it lines up with, you know, him being a vampire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I just appreciate having a villain where it's just like, God damn, he is so hot. I want to work with him just for that reason. And that's before he got flesh butted. Like, yeah, if it weren't for the forewarning, we must assume that Advil would have been flesh butted and, and Magician's Red would be at D Dio's command. Yeah. Jotaro now is saying like, okay, well, damn, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm just going to rip the flesh butt out of his brain. <laughs> right Everyone's here. like, no, no, you can't do that. It's, it's too delicate. It's impossible. Jojo reminds them that, hey, I have a really cool, strong stand that's very particular, very precise. Yeah, it, it is super fast. It is super precise, both in reaction time and movement. So even though Joseph says, hey, not even like a top-notch brain surgeon could remove this flesh bud without killing Kakyoin, Jotaro's just like, I could do this. It's fine. It's, it's good. It's all, all right. right. So he does, and uh, uh, very slowly, a lot of tension, Kakyoin wakes up in the middle of this surgery and is screaming <laughs> yeah. as Jojo's unnamed stand uh, extracts the, the flesh bud, but not without complication, because one of the flesh bud's tentacles goes up uh, uh, and burrows into Jojo's hand up the arm, making its way to the brain, try, trying to, you know, kill him or, or uh, uh, take him over uh, to yeah. leave the flesh bud alone. <laughs> It's real gross it's seeing the flesh gross. bud under his skin, just like this gross tentacle bulge un underneath his skin. It's nasty as hell. But Jojo's delinquent power is to be ice fucking cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, Avdol's really worried and, like, tries to go in to, to stop Jojo. A and Joseph's just like, wait, hold on a second. My grandson's a badass. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> so in, in the last possible moment, uh, he succeeds. The, the stand pulls out the, the flesh bud as it tries to leap away. And Joseph hits it with a little overdrive karate chop. Hell yeah. Even in part three, there's still a little bit of hormone. We, we still get to see a couple overdrives throughout this. It's great. Every time we see an overdrive or, or any hormone glow, I'm going to expect it to be the last time. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, the the, the whole stand power was made explicitly because Araki was having a hard time figuring out other ways to keep Hamon interesting. A lot of the, you know, especially in part one, a lot of the the attacks were named after colors. It's a black and white publication. (laughs) Hamon was a more intangible power. So, you know, everyone, that's why Speedwagon even existed to explain you know, what the fuck was even happening? You know, he switched over to stands so that there was a far more, like, visual thing. Yeah, where you yeah. Could just more easily tell what they were doing with less explanation. The abilities are embodied in, in a physical, tangible way. Yeah. Even from the get-go, I think stand, stands start out fairly strong. Mm-hmm. I uh, mean, incredibly it's... strong. Did, did you see that punch? <laughs> it was a really good punch. You know, tons of other media have been influenced by... The, the concept of the stand, like the entire Persona game series is just based off of the idea of stands. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. The, almost exactly the same thing where it's just like, hey, it's just kind of like a ghostly reflection of you in some way. But even right away, it's just really fun that each guy has their own weird ghost. Yeah, yeah. You and know, it, and if you take out the, the mystical connection or that it is an embodiment of your fighting spirit, you even see mm-hmm. it in things like Pokemon. Yeah, yeah, totally. That would explain all the the NPC trainers that only have, like, one Pokemon. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah. And then if you go the other direction, you you take away the the, uh, physical thing and just have you know, the power of fighting spirit. Now now you're in Gurren Lagann territory, or or get a race, I guess. Yeah, yeah, totally. I can see that. But yeah, now that the flesh bud is gone, uh, Kakioin just kind of, he just sits up. And he's just kind of quiet for a bit, <laughs> but he's nice now. He's nice. Uh, he he's nicer now. He he is uh, grateful to everyone for saving his life. Holly comes by and is isn't too particularly phased by all the crazy shit going on here. <laughs> I guess you know her her dad told her about all the crazy shit he did. I guess mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe there was a day when she was like ten or twelve where he he sat her down and instead of doing the birds and the bees talk, he just did the pillar men talk. Oh God, uh, that is. <laughs> That is going to mess up a kid. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I saw a man burrow into a Nazi's face. I hope her husband is just kind of dumpy. Like, no no uh, yeah. uh, muscle mass to speak of. <laughs> it must be a nice change of pace, actually. I hope he's bald. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're never going to see a, a JoJo with male pattern baldness. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> Doesn't matter how old they are. We all have, like, a moment to reflect and relax after all that tension. Joseph hates the the practice of sleeping on futons in the Japanese style. Yeah, he doesn't like tatami mats. <laughs> like uh, he wants all this shit replaced with a real bed. I want to watch this side by side with the the King of the Hill J- Japan trip two parter. <laughs> I feel like they they would be a, a, a nice pairing. Yeah, but uh, Holly is not having this. She she insists that when you are in Japan, you do as the Japanese do, including using her Japanese name. And uh, uh, Joseph yeah. is a big fussy baby man who will do no such thing. Yeah, he, you know, her Holly is derived from holy, and and holy in Japan is is like Seiwako or or Seinaru. Is she named for Dio? Is she Holy Diver? The music reference. Oh shit! Is that why she's named Holly? I maybe that must be it. Maybe. That, I mean, there's a it, lot it of like be. holy songs out there, but it's the one that jumps to mind. Yeah, that that would make sense. But yeah, ho- you know, holy and holy and. and Japanese holy is Senaru, so pe- her nickname is like Seiko, and she's like, okay, dad, call me that. And he just d- will not abide for it. He gets real pissy about it. But yeah, th- this is too much change for, for a fussy big baby old man to handle. So uh, uh, <laughs> Joseph freaks out and gets clicky fingers in his frustration. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that clicky fingers, like, continue. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. wasn't just a one-off thing. And, and I thing. love that it was uh, uh, sort of called out and foregrounded in their first appearance, uh, yeah. So that now it just happens as part of the soundscape, and ah, yeah, it's good. So we we cut over to the following morning, mm-hmm. uh, and Joseph is walking around uh, in in pajamas, dragging the bed sheet that's wrapped around his foot, whining that uh, so so he's got some pants, but they're the right size for him, but they're Jotaro's pants, and he doesn't want these because he doesn't like the stuff the style. <laughs> Well, yeah, all his pants have bizarre slashes through the knee. This is not the first time this has happened. Oh, man. So he's calling out for Holly, and he can't find her. 
Jotaro also thinks something weird's going on because he's ready, getting ready to go to school, and his mom isn't there to give him the little the little goodbye kiss. He gets every single day. Mm-hmm. But it is Avdol that that uh, figures out what's missing because he notices an ominous spoon, oh. an incredibly ominous spoon. <laughs> He looks inside the the house and sees there's a whole bunch of kitchenware kind of scattered all over the floor and and uh, the fridge door is open. You know, honestly opens very slowly and it reveals just Holly's hand on the floor mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. she has she has passed out. Uh, Av- Avdol like apologizes for what he must do as he flips her over and and pulls down her shirt to reveal her bare back. Apparently, she was wearing some sort of backless tank top. <laughs> yeah oh holly is short for halter halter cujo there we go yeah yeah he, he pulls it down because he notices barely just on like the nape of her neck like some weird like ghostly vines appearing all over her back are just ghostly like thorny vines everywhere mm-hmm, kind mm-hmm. of like very much like uh her her father's uh, uh hermit purple and now and like she's just she's breathing heavily she's suffering from like a heavy fever and Avdol just starts auditioning to be the new Speedwagon as as he yes. narrates everything we all need to know to no one. But but those things are that, yeah, whatever is activating stands in, in uh, Joseph and, and Jojo is, of course, hitting the uh, uh, is hitting the generation in between. But she, mm-hmm. she doesn't have uh, the, the same fight in her. She doesn't have the, the, the guts that the, the <laughs> Joestar boys do. Uh, the stand awakening uh, is is bound to to kill her to to overcome her and snuff out her life this this yeah. strange curse passed on from Dio and so it's a good thing that her her family has uh arrived at the door and heard the important parts his narrating was not useless <laughs> yeah uh Joseph and Jotaro are you know they're both pretty worried even Jotaro seems like a little worried even though he clearly doesn't want to show them like that. Uh, Joseph, like, starts yelling and crying and slams <laughs> Jotaro up against the wall just because he's so mad. Yeah. He has to take it out on somebody. Yes. Uh, he, he like, burrows his face into into Jotaro's chest because he's just so worried. I actually, I, I really like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I want this to be the moment that, like, wakes up Jojo to... He is not bound to this family. That has been very clear. But I, mm-hmm. I hope, you know, it helps him realize that there are family bonds that he could have if he wanted them. Yeah. But but Jojo's still trying to play it all cool. He grabs Joseph and kind of pushes him away a bit and just goes like, okay, enough crying. How do we fix how do we fix this curse my mom has? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and Joseph immediately just says Okay, I know that how to, what what we do here. We just fucking kill this, the 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 source of the curse. Let's murder Dio. <laughs> it's time to murder. It's time Dio. to murder Dio. <laughs> I knew he was a problem, but now we have to kill him dead right now. <laughs> yeah. In order to kill Dio, you must first find Dio. So we go back to the spirit photography, and uh, uh, Joseph is like, "It's no use. It's too dark." Uh, there, there's no way to find any clues in here. We already tried, but Jojo says, "Just you wait, old man." The the superpower that is precision is incredibly flexible. <laughs> yeah, because to to be precise and to to be able to catch speeding bullets that are super fast, you got to have good eyesight too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So so he uses his stand's precise vision to to zoom and enhance on the most recent Polaroid yep. and then uh, replicate with uh, incredible precision and accuracy in a pencil sketch a picture yep. of a fly. <laughs> yeah, there's a fly in the background that just could not be seen with the, the human eye. So Avdol takes it upon himself to, to hit up the library to, to research this specific breed of fly that he thinks he recognizes. He's got to, mm-hmm. you know, check some sources to be sure. Imagine the librarian that has to shush Advol. <laughs> we haven't mentioned yeah. it, but he's a very shouty man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Avdol, Avdol is a, a loud guy. And this is the, the first time I've ever really, like, listened to the English of a Stardust Crusaders. I think Avdol's voice is pretty funny because he sounds like he's got a stuffed up nose. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a little he's a little you know like this a little bit yeah avdal is can be pretty dramatic he's not speed wagon level but he's probably the closest you're going to get in the main cast <laughs> but yeah he, he goes off to start researching stuff in the private library that they have in their home it's a really uh, big house it's a big fucking house are they sponsored by the speed wagon foundation oh i wonder is, is this all just a gift from from grandpa's grandpa Mm, Grandpa's big uncle. 
But Kakyoin goes to check in on Avdol to see, like, hey, can I help, you know, with the research or anything? I, I feel bad just sitting here. Uh, and also, you know, goes to Avdol to get some more exposition from him, going like, is it possible for you to stand just to kill yourself? Just to kill you? You know, Avdol explains more on this. And yeah, but basically, if you do not have the fortitude to control your stand, it'll just it'll just fucking kill you like an illness and it'll just look like a completely unexplainable illness that doctors cannot figure out mm-hmm. death by stand <laughs> uh, while explaining this also getting like some weird imagery of holly fucking naked getting wrapped up in vines <laughs> like that part but anyway but we, we have an estimated 50 days start the clock mm-hmm M- meanwhile, uh, Holly's aw- uh, awake, and Joseph is is being a, a big old daddy. Uh, oh, overwhelmingly so. <laughs> I, I like. I really like the scene of Joseph going to dad mode, even though. If you this know, is the treatment JoJo got when growing up, I can kind of see why he resents his mother. This is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's all, d- dude. Joseph is like a super doting father. Like. He brushes her teeth for her. He combs her hair, gets all the knots out. Like he clips her fucking nails, gives her a massage, and all this stuff. And then Holly makes it weird by asking him to change her underwear. <laughs> underwear. You are forty five years old. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> he, he he fucking peels an apple and feeds like each individual little chunk to her. It's 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 shocking that Jo that Joseph doesn't fucking like masticate the apple and just you know fucking puke it into her mouth like a mama bird. Like that's the only thing he doesn't do. Uh, he he is a daddy in at least two ways. Good good job, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo is is also there, and you know, so so Holly wants to talk to her son, and his way of caring is to just shout, "Shut the fuck up and get better already." <laughs> God damn it! Yeah, yup. <laughs> and, and Joseph's just like, "Okay, all right, let's let's calm down. Let's tuck her back in, into bed." And, and you know, she she's trying to hide the fact that she feels really sick because she yeah. basically the second she's tucked she immediately passes out again mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so like th- this has apparently been uh like yeah with, with uh her son noticing she was pale earlier this has been uh, uh happening for a while and she's been putting up on a, a brave face uh, all this time yeah. who knows how many times she's just been passed out while her son is off gallivanting destroying uh, uh men's balls <laughs> It's his number one pastime, <laughs> crushing balls. I'm gonna smash um, some balls, drive some RC cars in jail. <laughs> Avdol comes rushing in, and he is—he's figured out what the fly is. It's the the Nile uh, way way fly, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is uh, a fly that only dwells within the Nile River basin. So it's a—you're really nar- starting to narrow it down a little bit here. Mm-hmm. Between <laughs> Avdol saying. I saw Dio in Egypt, this fly being pictured uh, with Dio in Egypt. And Kakyoin also says, yeah, I met Dio when I was in Egypt. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They're pretty sure he's in Egypt. (laughs) Yeah. And really all the fly does is kind of narrow it down a little bit more Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to a slightly more specific area than just all of Egypt. I guess. And and the fly confirms that he was in Egypt yesterday rather than a few months ago. (laughs) Yeah. That helps. Kakyoin, uh, you know, basically just goes like, "Can I join the party? <laughs> can I be a uh, can I be a, ma- a, a, a main party member? I want to help." You know, they ask him like, "Why do you want this?" And Kakyoin doesn't really have much more of an answer. Just like, "I don't know. You help me. Mm. Thanks." It's because your mom's hot, I think. <laughs> yes, actually, he gets a little weird. Yeah, <laughs> he gets weird in this scene, and he even prefaces what he's about to say with, "I'm sorry if this is kind of awkward, but if I were ever to date and marry a woman." Damn, I wish it was a lady like Holly. <laughs> She's so kind. I love her. I want to save your hot mom's life. Uh. Yeah. I mean, you know what? If there's any motivation for killing a vampire, I want to save your hot mom. That works for me. <laughs> so so the, these four strapping dudes, uh, current JoJo, past JoJo, the artistic one, <laughs> yeah. and, and our mystic pal from the Orient... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they they all load up and and uh, step forward across the threshold in unison to pose for for their hero uh, uh, album cover shot. Yeah, <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. It's really good. And while while they're doing this, uh, like you know, who's gonna look after Holly? And uh, a whole bunch of like black cars just 
line up mm -hmm. right in front of the house and a bunch of dudes in suits and sunglasses all, looking all like secret agent style like come rushing in and they are all doctors and men from the Speedwagon Foundation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even in part three and even into further parts, Speedwagon lives on because the Speedwagon Foundation is a constant force in the world of JoJo. <laughs> Speedwagon ran his own Petra state. Like, <laughs> uh, so so as they they are ready to uh, continue on to the adventure ahead, the the ending finally hits the the ending proper because I guess it would all be spoilers if it happened earlier. <laughs> Oh, and even before this, uh, uh, Avdal pulls out a deck of tarot cards because it's time to name Jojo Stan. Yes. So we, we pick a card, any card, to uh, uh, name the Stan. He picks the, the star card, and uh, Avdol names the, the Stan Star Platinum. Yeah. It's a pretty good name. Star Platinum. It's got a, got, got a good ring to it. It's like way it. better than Hierophant Green. Yeah. Hierophant Green. Mm, Hermit Purple. I like the sound of Hermit Purple. Hermit Purple sounds like a band. Yeah. Magician's Red also sounds like it could be, well, I don't know if it's a band, but I like the sound of Magician's Red. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the, the ending is way more dynamic than the part one ending. Oh, yeah. There, there's actual animation happening and not just slow pans over stills. It plays to the bangles walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the spoiler. There it is. Uh-huh. Yep. Gotta save that until you know we're going to Egypt. Like, it, in the opening and the ending, there's a lot of shots of a, a fifth member of the party we haven't met yet. That's not mm -hmm. too spoilery to show. Fine, fine. But yeah, <laughs> the song that specifically mentions Egypt, that's got to wait. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, so, But I, I like the, the tarot card art that every character is shown with in, oh, in yeah. their part. Especially the, the hermit card, because it's a weird old dude with a fanny pack. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot. And and this is the story of Grandpa going on vacation, and you need a fanny pack for that. Mm -hmm. His fanny pack says Lucky Land on it for some reason. <laughs> I'm sure that's some type of reference. Th this is not quite the end, though, because this is one of the, the uh, occasional JoJo episodes with a post credit scene. Mm -hmm. uh, this one shows them traveling by map, very Indiana Jones style, jumping from, from travel hub to travel hub. Uh, out, out of Japan towards Egypt until we, we get a, a insert scene inside a plane with our, our four, our, our band of brothers together uh, talking about how, you know, you know, you can't get too careful. Who knows how many agents Dio has? There may even be one on this plane as they all uh, uh, check their flies. I mean, uh, uh, there, there is a fly, a conspicuous fly. <laughs> There's a very evil looking fly that screeches. It's, a, it's got a creepy weird face. And also, while this is, is happening, we, we get a shot of uh, Dio also using spirit photography. He seems to have a, a similar hermit purple style sand, karate chopping a camera and, and getting a, a picture of uh, Joseph and Jotaro sleeping on this plane. And like Joseph and Jotaro feel it. They, they could tell that, jo that Dio just looked at them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's also an evil bug Very on evil this bug. plane. And uh, yeah, that's the end of episode three. This much more than part two. Uh, mm -hmm. This one feels like a, a, f a solid three-part story to begin with. Yeah. So I guess as long as uh, Jonathan's body is involved, that that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we've got our inciting incident, and we, we're, we're laying down uh, our first characters, and it closes with them off on an adventure, right? It, it's mm. it's a three episodes showing, you know, act one of this story ahead. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I think it, the the kind of like, you know, just kind of journey road trip story of getting to Egypt and finding Dio, that is part three. I think it's really enjoyable. It's a, a bit of a different format from the, the previous two parts because now it's because now there's tons of minions of Dio that, that are going to, you know, try to fight them along the way. It kind of turns into a stand of the week thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, different format from the previous previous two, which were kind of just more of a ongoing, you know story series of events probably one of the other biggest big changes aside from you know the introduction of stands is in part one and two while there were other people accompanying the jojos on their journeys they were more side characters and in this one they're just all the people along on the journey with jojo like get almost the exact amount of same like screen time as jotaro does mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm i'm excited for like yeah full adventuring party shenanigans 
I think Stardust Crusaders pulls off like a, a pretty enjoyable like party because they all kind of have different dynamics with each other and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, to to go back to uh, another point we we've brought up a lot is I, I think mm-hmm. a, a missed opportunity in in part one and part two is uh, really exploring the the emotional connections and the relationship dynamics that are set up that are present but don't mm-hmm. get the the spotlight the highlight that i think they deserve uh, caesar is the biggest example uh dio and jonathan the biggest counter example like that that is what makes part one and and i love that yeah yeah but we are already doing more of that in, in part three, specifically between Jojo and his grandfather. Yeah. It's, I, I love that shit. Uh, I am very, very happy to see that go and, and see, yeah, what, what sort of uh, uh, frictions uh, between uh, uh, the, the rest of the group. Like, what, are, are these two uh, uh, sidekicks, going, how are they going to relate to one another? They they had a right. nice uh, library conversation. I I'd like to see how their <laughs> yeah. vibe develops. Yeah, and I think the show does a pretty good job of of developing all of that for basically every combination of character. There's a a fair amount of of interaction between them, which I think is really nice. Yeah, it, like even more than part two, I think part three com- comes off of feeling even more confident. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's still definitely going to be a couple of things where it's like okay that character wasn't actually important when it felt like maybe they were or oh okay this thing kind of got tweaked a bit just because Araki thought actually this would be better Uh, Mm -hmm. part three and four are probably the ones I've seen that have the least amount of that and also when they do happen are the least frustrating (laughs) Um, and it also really helps when you have stands where it's like they all have unique powers and it, it's a lot easier to change the rules because mm-hmm, that is mm-hmm. the inherent nature of stands is that they all have their own set of rules, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, and the the way the passing of the torch happens for the first time, really, because yeah. if the previous Jojo is dead, there's no question of why he's not doing anything. But but mm-hmm. for, for Joseph, for, for things to now be in a stands are the thing, that is clear. If you don't have a stand, you're, you're out of luck. You know, Mm -hmm. much like Hamon used to be. But if your stand is only dangerous to cameras, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, uh, you you have to take the back seat. He he is by by being given this support power, he is now necessarily a support character. Yeah, Uh, uh, and and I think that is a more interesting and more I don't know elegant way to to make that transition than saying, oh, he just got old. Yeah, yeah. That, that's boring. Old dudes can kick ass, especially in, like, if you're kicking ass with your brain power, your your <laughs> your fight will. Like, that. that's something that's so great about stands is that now mm-hmm. not everybody has to be the, the muscle hunk. Yeah, there's still, especially in part three, there's still a lot of muscle hunks, but that is one of the stated reasons Araki also made the change to stands because he wanted, like... He wanted weak, physically weak people to be able to fight too, mm-hmm. or to have you know different looking characters that aren't just super huge dudes uh, have the ability to fight, and I like that a lot. The, something I really like, especially with Joseph, who is just a support guy with with spirit photography. There are times where he still has to fight throughout this, and the ways he f- manages to do that while having a support stand are really cool. Well, yeah, he's Joseph. Um, He'll figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, man. It's like, his thing. Like those, despite being old, some of those jo- old, young Joseph qualities are still there later on, and it's really fun when they when they play with that stuff. L- look at all of the things he did with just a hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, sp- speaking of Hermit Purple, uh, it has a very clearly defined use case and and draw bra- and drawback. I'm excited mm-hmm. to see what. Uh, um, what weaknesses, what limits are put on our other three mm-hmm. heroic stands and, and yep. then how they cleverly evade those. I, I guess we've already mentioned Star Platinum uh, in the fight against Hierophant Green. Kakuin w- was bragging about his range advantage, but yep. uh, Jojo overcame that just by jumping on a desk. It's not the most interesting <laughs> <laughs> way to get around your weakness, but it, it worked. While Star Platinum starts out as just being just an absurdly powerful like brute force stand especially much later on some of the later fights in the series he does some really cool super clever stuff with star platinum Mm -hmm. they're super creative uses of what his stand can do i mean it's already starting when you define your superpower as precision that's incredibly uh uh, open-ended right 
uh, I mean, comparing it to to uh, Western comic book characters uh, who have much more tangible physical uh, uh, powers that are, you know, in themselves, mm. not in a spooky ghost that uh, uh, steals comic <laughs> books for them. There, there's much less creativity in use. Like uh, the, the biggest one you can think of is like the Flash who can move so fast, but that also means temperature powers and phasing through things and uh, mm-hmm. uh, imparting overloaded like kinetic energy to make things explode. But he's just one guy. <laughs> and even mm-hmm. speed, at least when you tie it into physical things like theoretical uh, uses of physics isn't as wild and conceptual as just the notion of precision. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just precise. In what? I don't... In everything. Try me. In literally Fucking everything. Try me. <laughs> yeah. I do like that. The way that happens is Jotaro is just like, I don't know. I could catch a bullet. That could probably be applied to a whole bunch of things. Let's just try drawing. Oh, hey. Look at that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure Kakuin would have appreciated it if he tried it on drawing first to see if precision was really the thing before trying it on deadly <laughs> brain surgery. Yeah, that's true. But hey, it worked out. It worked out. It's fine. It's Everybody's fine. You've got a hot mom. I'll forgive you. There's a mix of, of both of these things. But a lot of the time, if a stand suddenly gets a new ability or power, it's far less frequently because something happened to unlock that unlock that, and just go like, hey, I leveled up. I have a new thing. It's far more frequently just like somebody tries a new thing out and they go, oh, shit, that worked. And now it's a part of the repertoire of abilities. <laughs> Especially in later parts, a lot of people use their stands in ways where they're just like trying to stretch it as far as it can go to see what it really can do and, and, and not do. And I think that's a cool way of getting new powers, just trying shit out. <laughs> Like, like, like I said at the earlier, I, I've gone from hating this new JoJo to beginning mm-hmm. to like love to hate this new JoJo. Like, yeah, his his mom is right. There is a good boy core under all of his bad, bad, bad boyness. <laughs> and I'm hoping uh, uh, to see like a little uh, a little crack in the door to let let your mm-hmm. light shine just a little bit, just a tiny bit. <laughs> That that has the potential to be a very endearing journey, to be sure. Yeah. And yeah, even aside from that stuff, there there is a certain point where you do just enjoy Jotaro's presence because, you know, like the whole speech he gave about him knowing, you know, being able to suss out bad guys and being kind of like the, the jury, the judge jury and executioner for those dudes when he finds them. There's a real satisfaction anytime there's a fight where Jojo is, where, where, where it's Jotaro who gets to land the finishing blow because everyone else also gets kind of like their own fights to, mm-hmm, to shine. Mm-hmm. But it's always satisfying because, you know, like that antis- anticipation of him like loading up each finger into a fist to punch. It never that shit never gets old throughout all of part three. <laughs> Every time it happens, you're like, "Oh fuck yeah, he's gonna punch him really hard," <laughs> because the the way they lead up to it is kind of different every time. And even though you know it's coming, it's it's really satisfying. The key to making an unlikable person, like like a character that would be just absolutely vile, into a likable character, is to have them yeah. to- remain true to themselves. Yeah, and he he is absolutely like that kind of character. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of it in the fight against Kakyoin, but you'll you'll hear it a lot more in later fights. A lot of the time when Jotaro punches somebody with Star Platinum, they dub over like there's a punch sound effect, but they also will frequently dub over it with a gunshot sound effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make the punches sound even more powerful, they put gunshots in along with it, and it's really cool. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So I think we should steer toward an ending uh, of our it's two hours. Oh my our god, <laughs> longest recording to date. Uh, this will tighten up a bit, uh, but yeah. it's it's going to be our longest episode for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a lot of big changes. Yeah, I mean, I I knew this one would go long because yeah, it is. It's the biggest change, and everything is new. Ev- ev- not only the characters and their adventure, but our assumptions about the world and the way it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so there's a lot, a lot of meat to chew on here. Uh, we will be back next week as, as, uh, our heroes become fly swatters. I can only assume, uh, (laughs) and, and meeting some more of these, uh, flesh bud buddies that that Dio Mm -hmm. has sent to stop them. Love the flesh bud buddies. So we will see you then. Look forward to that next time. See you everybody. To be continued.